the first thing we need to do is establish that there will be a kingdom of God upon the earth. And that's why we read Psalm 2. The first thing to notice about Psalm 2 is that within these 12 verses, there are actually four speakers. There's no title to this psalm in the book of Psalms, but the New Testament tells us who wielded the pen that wrote these words. Keep a marker in Psalm 2, please, and turn with me to the Acts of the Apostles and chapter 4. In Acts chapter 4, we have the apostles gathered together in Jerusalem after Peter and John have been interrogated by the Jewish rulers because they had healed a lame man. And Peter and John go back to the rest of the disciples and report. Acts 4 and verse 23. Being let go, they went to their own company and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said unto them. And when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God, which hast made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is. Who by the mouth of thy servant David hath said, Why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth stood up and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. So they quote from Psalm 2, and this is what they say about it. They say that the words that we've read in Psalm 2 are God's words which came out of David's mouth. And that's what we mean when we say that the scriptures are inspired of God. They're God's words and David spoke them and wrote them down. So with that in mind, keep a mark or a finger in Acts because we'll be back there in a minute and turn back to Psalm 2. David as king fought against the surrounding nations and put them under tribute and subdued them. And they objected to that and they resisted. The heathen raged. The kings of the earth set themselves against the Lord, the God of Israel, and against his anointed, who in this context is David, and said, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. They wanted to throw off the yoke that David had imposed upon them. But, David says, speaking God's words, verse 4, He that sitteth in the heaven shall laugh, the Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath, and vex them in his sore displeasure. And then God speaks, verse 6, Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. And that's David. Saul never went anywhere near Zion. His capital was Gibeah in the land of Benjamin. But David, when he became king over all the twelve tribes, immediately took Jerusalem and made Zion his capital. And now we have another speaker in verse 7. I will declare the decree. The Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Come back to the book of Acts, and this time chapter 13. And that speaker is identified for us. Acts chapter 13, Paul and Barnabas have travelled to Antioch in what today we would call Turkey, and they're speaking to Jews and Gentiles in the synagogue at Antioch. So Acts 13, verse 32. And we declare unto you the glad tidings, how that the promise which was made unto the fathers, God hath fulfilled the same unto us their children, in that he hath raised up Jesus, as it is also written in the second psalm, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. The word again isn't in the Greek text. It's talking about the birth of Jesus, and then it goes on in the next verses to talk about his resurrection. So we have the authority here of the Apostle Paul speaking the words of God that Psalm 2 verse 7 is about the birth of Jesus. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. The Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And God begat him that he might set him upon his holy hill of Zion, upon the throne of his father David. Turn on to Acts 17 now, and just look at verse 31. Acts 
Acts 13 mentions the resurrection of Jesus. Acts 17 verse 31 now. Because God hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men in that he hath raised him from the dead. So Jesus is the future judge of the world. And that's confirmed if we now go back to Psalm 2 and you can lose the marker in Acts. If we go back to Psalm 2 now and verse 8 where God responds to, to Jesus' statement in verse 7 Ask of me and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. And that's a prophecy of what King Jesus will do when he is established as king in the earth. He will rule the world. He will subject all its inhabitants to his authority. So, God now through David instructs human rulers. Verse 10. Be wise now therefore, O ye kings. Be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry. And ye perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. So the instruction is, serve God. Honour his king, Jesus. And all who do that will receive a blessing. That's religious language. That involves worship. And we're going to see in the passages that we're going to look at now that this is what's going to happen in the kingdom of God. We believe that there are signs in the world around us that these things will soon happen. But that's another subject. Tonight we're going to concentrate on the worship that's going to take place in the kingdom of God. Because in this kingdom of God, men and women are not going to be left to their own devices. The city of Jerusalem is going to become the greatest centre in the world for teaching and learning. Turn with me to the prophecy of Isaiah and chapter 2. And God showed all this to Isaiah in a vision about 700 BC. Isaiah chapter 2 and verse 1. The word that Isaiah the son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow unto it. And many people shall go and say, Come ye and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. And he will teach us of his ways and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the Lord. See the link to Psalm 2? I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. Out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he, the king, the anointed one, whom God has set on his holy hill of Zion, he shall judge among the nations, that's Acts 17 that we've just looked at, and rebuke many people, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. And we'll look at the subject of God's house later on. But this passage is telling us that God's law is going to go out from Mount Zion. And it's not just taught. It's enforced by the power that Jesus the King will have. And the people of the world will come to acknowledge that this law of God is better than any of their national laws which their rulers had promulgated in time past. And implicit in this law is that there's going to be one religion throughout the world. Turn back to the book of Psalms and this time Psalm 72. The title of Psalm 72 is a psalm for Solomon. Solomon was David's son, king in Jerusalem. And in many ways he prefigures the Lord Jesus Christ, the son of David. Psalm 72 verse 1. Give the king thy judgments, O God, and thy righteousness unto the king's son. He shall judge thy people with righteousness and thy poor with judgment. 
The mountains shall bring peace to the people, and the little hills by righteousness. He shall judge the poor of the people. He shall save the children of the needy, and shall break in pieces the oppressor. They shall fear thee as long as the sun and moon endure throughout all generations. See the parallels with Isaiah chapter 2. The enforcement of righteous rule. Something that the, the politicians of this world don't comprehend. And if you've looked at the contest that's going on in America for the candidates for the Republican and Democratic Party for the next presidential election, none of them are talking about righteousness. But this king will judge the people with righteousness. Three times it's mentioned in the first three verses of this psalm. And what's the response to all this? Verse 10 the kings of Tarshish and of the isles shall bring presents. The kings of Sheba and Seba shall offer gifts. Yea, all kings shall fall down before him. All nations shall serve him. So there's going to be a political response that the rulers of this world will be subject to the authority and the rule of the Lord Jesus Christ. But that's not all. Verse 15. And he shall live, and to him shall be given of the gold of Sheba. Prayer also shall be made for him continually, and daily shall he be praised. That's worship. Verse 17. His name shall endure forever. His name shall be continued as long as the sun, and men shall be blessed in him. All nations shall call him blessed. Again, we saw those words in Psalm 2. There is going to be worship and honour given to this king. Verse 19. And blessed be his glorious name for ever, and let the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and Amen. So there's going to be worship and glorification of God, and honour given to his king. There's going to be no more religious wars and conflicts in the world. Everyone will worship the one true and living God. Now, remember that in Isaiah chapter 2, it talks about the house of God. The Bible teaches that in Jerusalem, there is going to be built a temple, which is going to be the primary center of worship for the world. Come forward to the prophecy of Ezekiel and chapter 37. Ezekiel 37 is a wonderful prophecy. It foretells the restoration of the Jews to their land in two stages. And we've seen the first stage, it's called the Stick of Judah in the middle part of Ezekiel 37. And we've seen them go back, we've seen them established in the land again. And there's a second stage to come. Ezekiel 37 verse 21 and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen, whither they be gone, and will gather them on every side, and bring them into their own land, and I will make them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel. So there's got to be an Israel there first, which there is, for the rest of the Jews to be brought back and united with them, and made into one nation. And once that's happened, middle of verse 22, and one king shall be king to them all, and there shall be no more two nations, neither shall they be divided into two kingdoms any more at all. The Lord Jesus Christ is going to rule. And then verse 26, Moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them, it shall be an everlasting covenant with them, and I will place them and multiply them, and will set my sanctuary in the midst of them for evermore. My tabernacle also shall be with them, yea, I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And the heathen, the nations, the rest of the world, shall know that I, the Lord, do sanctify Israel, when my sanctuary shall be in the midst of them for evermore. So there's going to be a sanctuary, a tabernacle, a temple built at Jerusalem. And if you just go on through Ezekiel, you will find that the last nine chapters, chapters 40 to 48, describe in great detail this wonderful temple that's going to be built in the land. 
and it's repeatedly referred to as God's sanctuary. Just have a look, for example, at chapter 42 and verse 20. Ezekiel 42 verse 20 and, and the angel who is with Ezekiel is, is measuring this temple which Ezekiel sees in vision. He measured it by the four sides. It had a wall round about 500 reeds long and 500 broad to make a separation between the sanctuary and the profane place. 500 reeds if you do the arithmetic is roughly in English terms a mile. So we have a temple which is a mile square. If you ever go to Australia and go to Adelaide, the centre of Adelaide is approximately a mile square. You can walk round it, get some idea of the, the size. And it's going to be the centre of worship for the world. That's why it needs to be so large. Turn back to Isaiah, and this time chapter 56. Now, these words are quoted by the Lord Jesus Christ as he stood in the temple in, in the last week of his mortal life, just before his crucifixion. He quoted in the temple Isaiah 56. Verse 6, God says, Also the sons of the stranger that join themselves to the Lord to serve him, and to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants, Everyone that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it, and taketh hold of my covenant. Again, this is religious language. It's the language of worship. Even then will I bring to my holy mountain, Isaiah 2, and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be accepted upon mine altar. For mine house, and these are the words that Jesus quotes, mine house shall be called an house of prayer for all people. So we see from this reference, in addition to the other details that we've looked at, there's going to be animal sacrifice in this temple. There's going to be an altar. We'll come to that in a minute. But the next thing to notice about what the Bible says about worship in the kingdom of God is that although this temple will indeed be the central place of worship, it's not the only place. Turn on in the Old Testament now and find the prophecy of Zephaniah. It's about four books back from the end of the Old Testament. Zephaniah chapter 2 is an end time prophecy of God's judgments on the nations who hate Israel. And there are a few of them around in the world. And Zephaniah chapter 2 verse 11 tells us the result of of the outpouring of God's judgments upon these nations. Verse 11 of Zephaniah 2. The Lord will be terrible unto them, for he will famish all the gods of the earth, and men shall worship him, every one from his place, even all the isles of the heathen. So we, we've already seen the picture in other prophecies of the nations going up to Jerusalem, to the temple to worship, but they will also worship God from their own locations in all parts of the world. Go now to the last book of the Old Testament, the prophecy of Malachi and chapter 1. And in Malachi chapter 1, God is critical of the negative attitudes of the returned captives of Judah. They've come back from captivity in Babylon uh, and they're complaining about having to open the doors of his temple and, and do other duties. So God says, He's going to turn to the Gentiles. And here's the result, verse 11 of Malachi chapter 1. For from the rising of the sun even to the going down of the same, my name shall be great among the Gentiles. And in every place incense shall be offered unto my name and a pure offering. For my name shall be great among the heathen, saith the Lord of hosts. So again, here's a passage which tells us that all over the world, People will be offering worship to God. But as well as doing that, they will at certain times go up to Jerusalem. Just turn back about a page to Zechariah chapter 14, which is another end time prophecy, fulfilling the def uh, for foretelling the defeat of Israel's enemies and the establishment of the kingdom of God. Verse 9, And the Lord shall be king over all the earth, in that day there shall be one Lord and his name one. 
And verse 4 talks about the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ standing on the Mount of Olives, and the Mount of Olives splitting in two. Clearly a future prophecy. But have a look at verse 16. And it shall come to pass that everyone that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. This links us back to the law. Under the, the law that God gave to Israel through Moses, three times a year all the, the men of Israel had to go to the tabernacle or later the temple and worship God on certain days. And one of those was the Feast of Tabernacles, which is mentioned here. And this now becomes a law for all nations. And it's not optional. Verse 17, it shall be that whoso will not come up of all the families of the earth unto Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, <coughs> even upon them shall be no rain. And if the family of Egypt go not up and come not that have no rain, there shall be the plague wherewith the Lord will smite the heathen that come not up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. This shall be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all nations that come not up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. So while, as we saw in Isaiah chapter 2, there will be a willingness on the part of some, others will resist and the power of God will be manifest against them. God is giving them encouragement to come up and learn of his ways. He's also threatening punishments if they don't. Let's go back to Ezekiel now, to that description of the temple. Ezekiel 45, because these chapters don't only uh, describe to us the temple, they tell us what's going to go on in that temple when it is built. So Ezekiel 45 and verse 21. In the first month, in the fourteenth day of the month, ye shall have the Passover, a feast of seven days. Unleavened bread shall be eaten. And so it goes on. The Passover was one of those feasts that under the law all the men of Israel were commanded to appear before God at Passover time. And then in verse 25, in the seventh month, in the fifteenth day of the month, shall he do the like in the feast of the seven days, which is the feast of tabernacles, according to the burnt offering and according to the meal offering and according to the oil. These were times of gladness and rejoicing in Israel. The, the Passover celebrated their deliverance from bondage in Egypt when God brought them out and brought them through the Red Sea. And the Feast of Tabernacles, they celebrated and rejoiced in the harvest that God had given them. And this spirit of rejoicing in God's goodness is going to be taught to the nations in the kingdom of God. Now, clearly central to the feasts of Passover and Tabernacles was the offering of various animal sacrifices. And each kind of sacrifice had meaning and significance. And these things are explained to us in the early chapters of the book of Leviticus. So let's go back to Leviticus chapter 1 and just have a very quick look at the offerings that Israel offered. The first one in Ezekiel chapter 1 is the burnt offering and what it is to be, what sort of animal uh, and how it's to be killed and cut up and so forth are described in the opening verses. And then we read in, Ezekiel, sorry, in Leviticus chapter 1 verse 8 and the priests, Aaron's son, shall lay the parts, the head and the fat in order, upon the wood which is on the fire which is upon the altar. But his inwards and his legs shall he wash in water, and the priest shall burn all on the altar to be a burnt sacrifice, an offering made by fire of sweet savour unto the Lord. So every part of the animal was burnt on the altar. It's a symbol of total dedication. The Israelite brought his animal to the door of the tabernacle, put his hand upon the head of the animal, associated himself with it. And what he's saying is, I want to dedicate myself, my life, to the service of God. And I'm going to demonstrate this by offering a burnt offering, totally consumed. Then in chapter 2, we have the meal offering. It's called a meat offering in our English translation. 
but it's an offering of fine flour and oil and incense, as you see in chapter 2, verse 1. And he's got to bring that to Aaron's sons, the priests, verse 2, and he shall take that out, his handful of flour and all the oil and all the frankincense, and burn the memorial of it upon the altar. And the remnant, verse 3, of the meal offering shall be Aaron's and his sons. It's a thing most holy of the offerings of the Lord made by fire. So the Israelite brought the things which he had laboured for. He'd made flour out of the wheat that he had harvested, having first uh, tilled his land and sowed the seed and watered it and weeded it and so forth. It's the fruit of his toil, the fruit of his labours, which he brings to God in thanksgiving for all the good things that God had given to him. Then in chapter 3, and particularly in chapter 7 to which we turn, we have the peace offering. So Leviticus 7 and verse 15. So he brings his peace offering to the tabernacle, and it's not all burnt on the altar like the burnt offering. Verse 15 of Leviticus 7, And the flesh of the sacrifice of his peace offerings for thanksgiving shall be eaten the same day that it is offered. He shall not leave any of it unto the morning. Verse 31, And the priest shall burn the fat upon the altar, but the breast shall be Aaron's and his son's. And if you go through the details of the of this offering, part of it was burnt on the altar, a chief portion was given to the priest, and the Israelite and his family ate the rest. It's a meal of fellowship. God represented by the altar, his priest, and the family of Israel. And then if we go back to chapter 4, we have the sin offering. Just pick up at chapter 4 and verse 32. And if he bring a lamb for a sin offering, he shall bring it a female without blemish. And he shall lay his hand upon the head of the sin offering and slay it for a sin offering in the place where they kill the burnt offering. And the priest shall take of the blood of the sin offering with his finger and put it on the horns of the altar of burnt offering and shall pour out all the blood thereof at the bottom of the altar. And he shall take away all the fat thereof as the fat of the lamb is taken away from the sacrifice of the peace offerings. And the priest shall burn them upon the altar according to the offerings made by fire unto the Lord. And the priest shall make an atonement for him that, for his sin that he hath committed and it shall be forgiven him. So the sin offering is about covering the sin of the Israelite with the blood of the sacrifice and therefore obtaining forgiveness. And then finally in chapter 6 we've got the trespass offering. Chapter 6 verse 1 And the Lord spake unto Moses saying If a soul sin and commit a trespass against the Lord and lie unto his neighbour in that which was delivered him to keep or in fellowship or in a thing taken away by violence, or hath deceived his neighbour. Verse 4. Then it shall be, because he hath sinned and is guilty, he shall restore that which he took violently away, or the thing which he hath deceitfully gotten, or that which was delivered him to keep, or the lost thing that he found, or that about which he hath sworn falsely. He shall even restore it in the principle, and shall add the fifth part more thereto, and give it unto him to whom it appertaineth, in the day of his trespass offering. And he shall bring his trespass offering unto the Lord, a ram without blemish out of the flock with thine estimation, for a trespass offering unto the priest. And the priest shall make an atonement for him before the Lord, and it shall be forgiven him, for anything of all that he hath done in trespassing. So the trespass offering was when you had done harm to somebody else by taking something that was theirs or by some violence or lie or whatever. And you had to make restitution. You had to restore all that the person had lost plus 20%, fifth part, had to be added. And you had to offer a much more valuable animal as a sacrifice for a trespass offering than you did for a sin offering. And just as Israel had to learn these principles, which are much better than the laws of this country, you know, if somebody does harm to someone, they're fined and the fine goes to the state, or the person's put in prison. Well, what about the restitution? Most of the time, it doesn't happen. But the principle of 
the trespass offering was to make restitution for the harm done. And Israel had to learn these principles, and so will the nations of the world. We looked at Isaiah chapter 56, which talked about their burnt offerings coming up upon God's altar. And in those chapters in Ezekiel, chapters 40 to 48, all of the five altar offerings that we've just looked at, the burnt offering, the meal offering, the peace offering, the sin offering, and the trespass offering, are all mentioned in those chapters in connection with the temple worship. And all of this is going to be done to show to the people of the world the exceeding sinfulness of sin in the sight of God. Sin isn't something you just do and brush off and forget about. It's a serious issue. The nations will be taught to make restitution when harm is done to others. They'll be taught the need for every man to dedicate his service to God, to consecrate his labours to the glory of God. It will teach them the joy of fellowship with God when these things are done. And this is part of God's answer to our, our strife-torn and troubled world a huge divine education plan and one religion for the whole world which will ultimately bring peace and a rule of righteousness to this earth.